So my favorite season is coming up. I'm not talking about summertime. Summer is just too hot for me. The sun is just out, the, it like never rains. And so summertime is not really my like jam, I guess. Springtime, uh, it's not really hot. It's not really cold. Like springtime just is like confused. All it is is just wet. So springtime's not really my favorite season. My favorite season that's coming up is uh, baseball season. I love baseball season. I love everything about baseball, really. Uh, the strategy that's involved, the game itself, the beauty of the stadiums, the grass, the dirt. It's just amazing. Now, I grew up around Chicago, and so I'm a Chicago Cubs fan, and Chicago Cubs home is called Wrigley Field. Again, I love everything about baseball, and especially the Cubs, but one thing I love a ton at Wrigley Field is this. This is called a Chicago dog. Now a Chicago dog, as you can tell, it's a seasoned bun with a beef frank. And inside that like that mouthwatering goodness, you have different vegetables. You have like onions, chopped onions, you have tomatoes, pickle relish. Over here you have pickles on the side. Actually pickles are, the way I like it is like on the bun itself. The one thing you do not see on a, on a Chicago dog is ketchup. Ketchup is not allowed on a Chicago dog. The only condiment that's allowed is mustard, and that is it. And so today we're going to be talking about this idea of cravings, and we're going to kind of really hone in on spiritual cravings, because when I look at that Chicago dog, I have this massive craving for that dog because it's so, so good. And uh, today, like I said, we're going to continuing, uh, we're going to be continuing in... First Peter, and we've been working through First Peter, and uh, this is a letter that's written to exiles living in uh, like the the provinces of Rome, and they're under immense persecution. And so today, I want to kind of, I want you to kind of ask yourself a question: Is uh, um, what do you crave? What is the one thing that you crave? For me, like I crave a lot of different things as far as food. I love cheeseburgers. And so for me, I know it's not the greatest burger in the world, but I love In-N-Out. It's so good. The fries are great. Everything's good about In-N-Out. So I have always a craving for In-N-Out. For me, living in Sutherland, my favorite place to go for lunch is Smitty's. I crave Smitty's. Every time it hits 11, 11, 15, I'm like, okay, I need my uh, chicken bacon ranch wrap. And so I have those kind of cravings. I also love candy. And so I love uh, Sour Patch watermelons, any kind of chocolate really. Like I have these massive cravings. I also have different types of cravings. I crave spending time with my family. I love being with them, hanging out with them, playing games with them. We go hiking over uh, in the mountains. We go uh, over to the coast just to kind of hang out. And so I have cravings of family time. And so my question for you is, what do you crave? And spiritually speaking, what is something that you crave spiritually? Again, we're going to be hanging out in 1 Peter, and I want to read this passage to you. It's uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, 22, and we're going to hang out. We're going to actually go, excuse me, to chapter 2, ending at verse 3. It's actually only seven verses, and this is what it says. It says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for, for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Chapter two, starting verse one, or in verse one now, it says, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So we're gonna jump right into it. If you're taking notes, I encourage you, the first thing that I see here is this idea of eternal love. Again, we just went over in verse 22 of chapter one. It says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. 
So um, again, like uh, what we talked about last week, and we've been working through First Peter, and Pastor Jason talked last week about this, this call to holiness. And so this comes right after the call of holiness. And you see this, purify your souls with obedience to the truth. Now, when I see this purified, I instantly think of water purifiers. And what water purifiers are for, they, they kind of, um, they, they eliminate disease, they eliminate chemicals, they eliminate toxins that is in water uh, so you can drink it. And so that's why when we go on mission trips, when we go to Mexico, we say, make sure you don't drink the water because we're not sure if it's been purified. Making sure you're not like ingesting like chemicals or things that's going to harm you. And so through obedience to Jesus, this happens. You, you can't purify your own soul. And I think that's important to hear, especially coming out of this, this call to holiness. You can't purify your own soul. It's only through Christ. And too many of us, we, we get in this uh, legalism mindset where I got to do, 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 do. And it's all on me to do the things. And it's not on what Jesus has done for us. And so I need to pursue this and I need to keep doing this and I need to do all of these things and make sure I do those correctly instead of trusting that what Jesus has done for us. I love this. Love is the overflow of obedience. Love is the overflow of obedience. When you love someone, you listen, you obey to what they ask or what their expectation is of you because love is this uh, overflow of obedience. Now in relationships, friendships, uh, relationships with your spouse and your kids, something that's missing in a lot of lives is authenticity. You know, for me, I, I'm a sports guy. And so it's easy for me to talk about sports. It's easy for me to talk about how well the Cubs are going to do or how terrible the Bears are every year. But that's not being real because I'm not talking about things that matter. I'm not being authentic. I'm not being real about things that I'm struggling with, things I need prayer for. And so authenticity is where this is found, is being real and having real conversations. And we see love played out in this passage in two different places. Uh, uh, this brotherly love. This is where the word phileia comes from. And it's not just for brothers, but it's like this, this community. It's like a friendship. It's a brother-sister kind of love for each other. It's caring for each other far beyond just saying, hey, what's going on? It, it's much deeper than those things. And then secondly, the other love we see is love one another earnestly. This is where we hear the agape type of love. It's the sacrificial type of love. It's the unconditional type of love. It's the purposeful type of love. So do you crave these kind of real godly friendships? Now in 1 Peter, like Peter is writing to a group of exiled Christians living in Roman provinces that they're being martyred and killed for their faith. They're, they're being blamed for things they never did. They're being like pushed out of their homes, pushed out of their community. And, and Peter is saying, hey, have real authentic love for one another. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't that go, what, Peter, what are you trying to say? Because the reality is this, is when we have real authentic friendships with each other, we are emulating God's love for each of us. And that's what Peter's saying here. Um, this, this word earnestly here, it reminds me of my track coach back in high school. Um, his name's RJ. And RJ had a go-to saying. He would say, give it all you got. I ran the open 400, and what that is, that's the quarter mile run, uh, it's one lap around the track, it's 400 meters. And I believe it is by far the hardest race, you know, in a track meet. And it is essentially a quarter mile sprint. And so the best runners are running like at 46 to 48 seconds for a whole lap, which is crazy, so fast. RJ would say over and over again, give it all you have. Dig deep, pull. When it hurts, just keep pushing, keep pushing. What if we looked at our friendships, our relationships like that? Be real, keep pushing. Even when it's uncomfortable, ask those questions. Even when it's uncomfortable, answer those questions. Be real. And that's what Peter is alluding to here. So in your friendships, do you dig deep? 
I love this. How are you at loving others? Uh, I, I, do you crave to love well? Do you crave to be authentic all the time? The other thing I see in this passage here is uh, eternal word. This, this idea that, that Peter's really putting here, this eternal word. In verse 23 through 25, uh, Peter says, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the good news that was preached to you. Now, right here, we see this been born again. Now, if you've grown up in church, been around church, uh, or, or maybe you just heard of this, Jesus had a conversation with a religious man named Nicodemus back in uh, John chapter three is where this story plays out. And Jesus says, you must be born again. And so Nicodemus is really confused. He's like, what does this mean? Do I need to like, like, with, like with my mom? Like, I'm really confused. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. It's a spiritual rebirth. And that's what Peter's alluding, alluding to. It's a spiritual rebirth. It's a new life. The old has gone. The new has come is what the apostle Paul says. It's this new life. And God makes us alive in Christ. And I love this. This is the imperishable seed. You have not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. So perishable seed is something that decays over time. It's something that has, if you want to say like a shelf life, imperishable has everything to do with last forever. It endures forever. Now in chapter one of 1 Peter, Peter talks about this idea of perishable and imperishable multiple times. In verse four, he says, our inheritance is not uh, uh, perishable. In verse seven, he says, faith is not perishable. In, in verses 18 and 19, he says, ransom, talking about rescue, that that is not perishable. It doesn't decay. It doesn't die away. It endures forever. And now in verse 20, 23, excuse me, he says, God's word is not imperishable. What is Peter talking? Why does he keep on reminding them that, that um, our inheritance, our faith, our rescue, God's word always endures? I believe this. Again and again and again, he's giving them hope. Again and again and again, he's giving them life. He's giving this living hope. Now remember, these Christians are under attack these Christians are being attacked because of what they believe in, that, that Jesus is God. And they're being blamed for things that they didn't do, like this Roman fire. Like, it just didn't happen. He's being pushed out of their homes. And, and Peter is reminding them there's this living hope that happens. And he's also reminding them that this life is temporary. In, in verse 24, that's why he quotes Isaiah here. He says, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower dies. Dreams fade. Seasons come and go. I mean, there, there are moments in your life when things are great, moments in your life when things aren't. There are years in your life when it feels like everything's clicking and it feels like you're connecting, not just with God, but with everyone. And things are, you just feel as if God's just blessing you over and over again. And then there's years in your life where it feels like it's a miss all the time, over and over and over again. But, but the reality is this is temporary. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether um, you're famous or nobody knows you, this life is temporary, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, you may not be living in like this immense persecution. You may be feeling that in our country, we are exiles from what we believe this country was founded on and where we're at now feels so far away. What maybe some people or, or whatever is pushing on us may feel like it's against what, what God stands for us. And so we may feel like we're exiles in our own country. Jason said this multiple times last week. He said, look up, keep looking to Christ. 
And Peter talks about this again and again and again because he's talking about the word of the Lord. Look up. Something we've talked about for, I don't know, like a year plus now. We're talking about this idea of living on mission. Living on mission is where you live, work, and play. It's, it's, it's your school you go to. It's the workplace that you work at uh, and the people you connect with. It's uh, your neighborhood. It's the places where you go eat. Living on mission, pointing people to Jesus as you are drawing closer to him because the word of the Lord remains forever. In verse 25 here, we have word of the Lord and we see word again. And so there's some people that believe that this, this is quoting Excuse me, this is uh, like the Old Testament. It's the word of God. It's Isaiah. No, actually what this is translated to is, is the messages of Jesus. That's what this word of the Lord is translated to is messages of Jesus. It's the stories of Jesus. So Peter is saying the words of Jesus is the good news. The words of Jesus is the good news. I love this question. Do you really believe in the good news? Do you really believe in the good news? Is, or is this just something that we do for the sake of doing? That this is something we, if you gather on Sunday, you gather together. Do you really believe in the good news that it has the power to transform a life? That the stories about Jesus transforms lives? Do you believe in the good news? the words of Jesus, that he left heaven, that he lived a perfect life. He went through this sham trial and he died on a cross and his hope and his goal that no one shall perish. And not just that he died on a cross, but he came back from the grave and he ascended to heaven. And at this moment, he's praying for us do you believe in the good news? Do you believe that because of his life, because of his death, because of his resurrection, because of his ascension, that you can have a relationship with the father through him? Do you really believe the good news? Obviously, Peter did. Do you crave Jesus's words? Is this something that you just need in your life that you feel like you're missing? If you, if you don't get in his word, if you don't connect with people in a godly loving way, it, it, it feels like you miss something. It's a good evaluation question is like, if, if you miss a week of being with Jesus, can you tell? If, if you miss a day with being with Jesus, can you tell? If you truly crave something, it's something that you need. Do you really believe in the good news? The third thing that I see here is eternal hunger. Eternal hunger. This is in chapter two, uh, verses one through three. It says, uh, Peter says, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Um, when, when we look at this first word here, it says so. In chapter two, verse one, it says so. That word is like therefore. So it's almost as if Peter is saying everything that we learn in chapter two Moving into chapter three. Now, again, this is a letter. It wasn't broken up that way, but he's saying everything that we talked about here, moving forward, therefore. So what have we talked about in the last couple of weeks as we're exploring through first Peter? Drew kicked off this series and he said something that was like gripped me. He said, we're exiled people called to obedience through a living hope. These people, these Christians in the Roman provinces, they were exiled people. And, and there's something more. There's something beyond our circumstance. Last week, Pastor Jason, he talked about this call to holiness, that God calls you to holiness. 
And, and it's very easy to find yourself in one ditch or the other. The one ditch is this idea of license. And since Jesus died for me, I can do whatever I want or, or whatever. And so because he loves me so much, I can do all of this stuff. And it doesn't really matter because of his grace and because he loves me. And there's another side. The other ditch is this legalism side where it's very much like I need to do, 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 do. I need to work my way to heaven. I need to show God that I'm honorable enough and it moves away from what he's done. And so we have these two ditches we need to kind of, kind of be in the middle of, of what God is really leading us to. He also said, uh, um, our belief is played out in our behavior. So with all of that's been talked about in the first chapter, Peter goes, so he says, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Now, these are uh, words that we typically don't use in today's uh, vernacular, in today's world. And so I just want to break it down a little bit what these words mean, what these sinful words are. Malice is this intent to do evil. It's not just being mean. It's not just having a mean spirit. It is this intentional thing of doing evil. Uh, you have deceit. Deceit isn't just like a, a little fib or a little white lie. Deceit is where you're actively trying to conceal a truth. You're doing whatever it takes to conceal this truth. Um, you have hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is, is really where you don't want people to know the real you. It's where your uh, words don't really match your behaviors. And then you have envy. And envy is, is tricky. Envy is like this resentment that you have towards someone. And sometimes you have so much envy, so much resentment that you wish that their good fortune happened to you. And it's interesting how envy and slander kind of work together because when you're envious of someone, you have a tendency to slander their name or maybe even slander their, their reputation. And you have a tendency to kind of make muddy up the waters about who they are. And so Peter is saying all of those things we've talked about, put away malice, put away deceit, put away hypocrisy, put away envy, put away uh, uh, slander, and, but how do we do those things? How do we actually, and again, it can t almost turn into a works-based kind of thing. I got to do, got to do, got to do. But this is the answer to that question. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk. Now, Peter is not referring to baby Christians, like Christians that just crossed that line of faith. He's not referring to that. He's, he's making an analogy of, of infant babies, how newborn babies long for milk. Now I have three kids, Logan, Abigail, and Paxton. And so what that means at one point I had three babies and those babies loved milk. Not just because it, 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 it tasted good, but they needed it for their bodies to grow and to develop. It had the nutrients and the supplements that's needed for their bodies. You see the connection with what, what milk is and even what spiritual milk is. Spiritual milk is the word of God. It's, it's the messages of Jesus. And because of that, it helps us grow. And, and later on in, uh, uh, yeah, we got the, <laughs> the same gospel that brought you to Jesus, the same gospel that will sustain you. I love that. The same gospel that brought you to Jesus is the same gospel that will sustain you. Even in moments of frustration and moments of confusion, and moments of like hopelessness, again, when things aren't going so well, the, the same gospel that brought you to him is the same gospel that sustains you. And, and moving on, it says, and that you may grow up into salvation. This is the sanctifying work of the spirit. It's the sanctifying work of who I am today in 10 years is not who I wanna be. And who I was 10 years ago is not who I wanna be today. It's this sanctifying work that God is creating me more and more like Christ. And I think there's a lot of us that are 20 years into this thing with our relationship with Jesus about who Jesus is, or maybe 40, 50 years into this thing. And we never really grew, out, grew up past our teenage years. 
And I believe it's this, is that we didn't really crave godly relationships. We didn't really crave the good news. And so we've been kind of in this stuck position for such a long time. That you may grow into salvation. Again, this isn't a works base. This is through spiritual milk. But it's all dependent on verse 3. It says, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Um, Pastor Ed told me something and it stuck with me. I, I feel like uh, we have a plethora of great teachers and great minds, wise people. And it's almost like you gotta walk around with a pad just to write down all of these things that people say. And he said that you don't crave something you've never tasted. That is about 95% of true, percent true. Because there are times when something sounds good, even though you haven't had it, but, but you never really crave it until you taste it. Um, my mother-in-law, uh, Becky, she makes rhubarb cake. Uh, when I first started hanging out with her daughter, Nicole, I was 18, I was quite young, and uh, Becky made rhubarb cake. Now, a little backstory, um, I used to, I've had rhubarb before. Uh, when I would go outside and play, my neighbor had like grew some rhubarb and she was like, you can go over there and grab it anytime you want. And so we, we picked kind of a stalk and I took a bite of rhubarb and it was so gross. I was like, I don't ever want to eat this again. And so when I was 18, I was dating this girl, Nicole, and her mom made rhubarb cake. And she's like, Jeremy, do you want a slice? And I'm like, no, I don't like rhubarb. I don't like rhubarb. And she's like, you would like this. I'm like, I don't like rhubarb. And so I wish I could tell you that after, you know, maybe a month or whatever, every time they would ask, I, I eventually gave in. It was, you know, when I hold on to some, I hold on tight apparently because it was like a year, year and a half into it, into my relationship with uh, Nicole, that I was asked and I kept saying, no, no, no. Even though it smelled good, I was like, no, no, no. And then eventually Becky talked me into taking one bite. Now, every time I see Becky, I see someone who's loving. I see someone who's kind. I see someone who's fun, loves playing games. But I also, every time I see Becky, I always ask her, did you bring any rhubarb cake? Because it is so good. You see, you never really crave something if you've never tasted it. Once we taste spiritual milk, we begin to grow up. Physical growth isn't optional. So why do we think spiritual growth is? Why do we think it's optional if we grow in Christ or not? Because physically speaking, like we don't have an option. We continue to grow. So looking back at verse one, it says, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy, envy and all slander. These sins no longer taste good. What tastes good is the spiritual milk. These sins no longer have a hold on us, what we need and what we want. And once we've tasted that the Lord is good, this is all we want, not sin. We want the goodness and we crave the goodness of Jesus's words. So my question for you is, do you have a longing for the gospel? Do you have a craving for the gospel? Do you have a desire that it won't go away? I'd like to release to the campus. Have a great week and we'll see you guys soon. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around. I wanna go over the transformational moment with you. Uh, question is, what do you crave? It's pretty simple. I mean, like that's what we've been talking about this whole uh, uh, message is what do you crave? Do you crave godly relationships, godly friendships? Do you crave the good news? Do you crave the gospel? Do, do you crave at what brought you to Jesus? What do you crave? And I think this is a question that you can ask yourself, but what would it be like if you asked somebody else, hey, what do you see in my life? What do you think that I crave more than anything? So let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, for this chance to connect with you. Thank you for this series as we're walking through 1 Peter and, and trying to figure out what he's saying because he says a whole lot of stuff. But, but most importantly is, is what did you want to say to us? 
Jesus, I pray that um, as we evaluate ourselves and as we ask questions to other people, God, I pray that we are drawn back to you, that our craving is much deeper than anything is to know you more and more and more. That when we don't spend time with you or, or be around godly friendships for a while, that we miss you. That we want to be with you and connect with you and draw closer to you. God, I pray that this isn't something that we do for the sake of doing. Help this be something that we actually crave for spiritual milk. We trust these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. You guys have a great week and we'll see you soon. Bye guys.